Lord bless you. <clears throat> it's certainly uh, deemed to me a, a grand privilege to be here this morning. I was, it's an unexpected blessing because I didn't think I'd have this privilege to get to speak, especially to just you, what we would think would call a selected group. Uh, the ministers and my brethren here who are cooperating in this meeting and making it possible. I wanted this opportunity. This way I get a chance sometime to explain things that I, that I don't do at the platform because you're in a mixed audience there. And uh, I met an attorney here this morning, one of the brethren, the Christian businessman. And uh, last night I was speaking on uh, Zacchaeus once there. You know, when he, Jesus was in the... Uh, he hardly believed as the little drama was that he wasn't a prophet, but when Jesus stopped around the tree and looked up and called him by name and come down... I never did tell just what happened to Zacchaeus. You know what happened to that fellow? He became a member of the full gospel business. And <laughs> <laughs> the first member. He's the first member. He's a charter member there, that's right. Of course, Jesus wouldn't have nothing else but a full gospel. You know? so <laughs> he'd be in the business and that was one of your... So you can remember that. Man. And so... Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, speaking the other day on, uh, up at the last meeting uh, on having a court trial and Jesus brought, or God brought in about his word for a breach of promise. Many of you have heard it. And um, so I was thinking about maybe giving that Sunday afternoon this court trial and this attorney here, he might be able to correct me on some of the, <laughs> the procedure that I go about. So, uh, but sitting here this morning, it's certainly a, a privilege. I was looking around, different friends, as, a little boy here, a little friend here, just called me over there and is crippled. He said, Brother Branham, if you'll just tell me that I can walk out of here, that's all I want you to do. See? And I just thought, how, how lovely. See, but see, these things are a little different than what we, you think they are. See? see, now that's where I think many of the brethren gets off of the track. See, God will let them do something with a little faith. Then they feel that everything they bounce into, they just say it and that's all. But you see, how can I say, thus saith the Lord, until he tells me first? Right. I've got to have it first. If it didn't, I'd say, thus saith William Branham, but that wouldn't do any good. But see, he's got to tell me first. A man drove up in an ambulance with the babies, and I was real busy. He said, well, I, if you just tell him, come here and say my baby will be all right. That's all I want to know. Well, that, how lovely, but how can I say that until I know it? See? If I, some people just go on impression, the Lord told me to do this. Well, that's, that's yourself many times. See? You've got to actually see it and know it. How could, uh, could I, uh, Brother uh, Fox here, say something unless, if he's honest, he said, Brother Bram said so and so, and if I didn't say that, he's, he's falsely accusing me of saying something that I didn't say. But if I really said it, then I've got to stand behind it. So when the Lord says anything, that does it. I met a little Baptist here a while ago. He isn't bad. I think he's a Pentecostal Baptist like me. And, and um, he's another good old Southerner. I watched him eating this the Georgia ice cream this morning here at the, the grits. And um, so he, um, he was one of those persistent type, you know. And he smoked cigarettes and a very good Baptist. And he had, so he... he um, and he had a lot of things that he was going on. And he kept on now, out here in the meeting. It's those, you, you people, the people, they are doing that themselves, see. And it's Christ coming to his body. Now, let me get that right. Now, just stop with you just a moment. See, Christ coming to his body. That don't mean it just me. I'm not the body. I'm just a member of that body, see. You're part of that body too. By one spirit, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 12. By one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. We are members of that body. Every one of us. Whether you're a Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Oneness, Tunis, Fiveness, or whatever you got. See, by that one spirit, we are all in one body. If God accepts the oneness in with His peculiar idea... The church of God in with his peculiar idea, and the Methodist in with his peculiar idea, the assembly in with this peculiar idea, that's up to him. I got nine brothers, and every one of us different from another, but we all got the same parents. <laughs> See, we're everyone Branham's. <laughs> now, my brothers, I'm the hunter. I like to hunt and fish. The rest of them don't care for it. 
They like to play golf and things like that, but not me. See, that's my peculiarity. But yet, their father is my father. See, but we all agree when it comes to daddy. But that's all our daddy. And that's the way we do too. Now look, the church has become see just growing up, just like I was going to speak tonight upon the unveiling of well the one true God, but. I think it'll take a little too long, and I notice the people after about nine o'clock to get restless. I thought I'd just wait till sometime at the tabernacle. I got something else on my mind, maybe for tonight to bring a message of salvation. That's what we're trying. That's our, what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Now, you minister, brothers, waiting this divine healing. As old Doctor Bosworth, who just went home to glory down here recently, he used to say, uh, "Divine healing is a bait that you put on the hook. You never show the fish the hook. You show him the bait." <laughs> He gets the bait and gets the hook. So that's the way it is. We Divine healing just draws the attention. See? And then salvation is what we're after. Yeah, we're after the strength of the body of Christ, you see. And every one of your different organizations, some I'm not too much on the organization, just saying, I belong to this. I, I was ordained a Baptist. And then when I heard about Pentecostals, I thought, my, what's this? And I thought, that's what I'm going to join up with. And I come over here, there's broke up as the Baptists. It's just all different types of things. And it's all there. I thought, well, now I'm not going to join any of them. I'm going to stand right between them and put my arms around all of them and say, we're brothers. Amen. And see, the system that keeps us from being that, that's what I'm against. Amen. The system. That, Amen. See, and that's the reason I'm with one group, and that's a full gospel businessman. See, we want to stretch our tent so far that it'll take everything, all of them. See, everybody, we're all brothers. Oh, See, we're everyone brothers in Christ. Now, one of my, my great sponsors is Assemblies and United and Foursquare and the Church of God. And all those brothers, <laughs> they panned out to be real men. Now, what is it? Christ coming to his body. Christ is the Word. We all know the anointing is Christ that comes on the Word that makes the Word live. Is that right? That is the anointing. Christ is the anointing. The Spirit that comes up on the Word that quickens the Word to make it live. Now the Word is in your heart. You believe in divine healing, whatever more. See, and Christ, the anointing, come into His body. See, the connection there? Just like husband and wife to become one. Now, the church has got to get to the ministry until the church and Christ become one. He can anoint you for every blessing that's in the Bible. All of it is yours. Everything's promised that this age is yours. When we leave anything out, see, then if the anointing strikes that, it'll, it will anoint it. It's just, uh, here... Like, uh, I, I use this for an illustration, and there's a doctrine called pyramid doctrine, but don't never get that in your idea that I, that I, I believe in pyramid doctrines. I believe in the Bible. See? And um, although I believe the pyramid part played something, I believe God wrote three Bibles. He wrote one in the skies, which is the zodiac. Anybody knows that? Job spoke of it. What? Look at the zodiac. It starts off with the, with the virgin. It ends up with Leo the lion. That's how he comes. Thirst for the virgin. His next coming will be Leo the Lion. See, coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And all in there, the cross fishes is what we're in now, the cancer age and everything. It all speaks, but forget it. See, that ain't your Bible. Then the pyramids, exactly how they were drawn. The headstone was rejected. Still, that's not your Bible. Then God wrote it on words. Jesus comes three times. One time he comes to redeem his wife. Next time he comes to catch her away. The next time he comes with her. Three come and see everything like Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. See, all everything's in a three. The Amen. mathematics of the Bible is perfect. If you keep them mathematics right, you can keep your story right. See? But if you get off the mathematics, you'll have a in your picture a cow picking grass on top of a tree. So it won't, it won't look right. See, stay in the mathematics, see, of the Bible and you place it out right. Now, let's tell about this here young, fine looking fellow sitting here. He. He kept coming uh, every time he'd put his name on for a private interview. Well, when he would do that, then it'd wait a long time to finally his time come up. Here we come. Now, in private interview, it isn't like this. It isn't sitting in a meeting like we do here. You wait until the Lord speaks and shows you what to do. Well, it never, he never could, his time would run out. Well, he wouldn't be discouraged. He just put his name down for another one. So it finally worked down for you a few hundred till it got to him again. And then one day sitting at the place he would try he would take all the psychological ideas that he could to lay them cigarettes down and he couldn't do it but one day it come thus 
saith the Lord. That was it. That was the last of it. And um, so here he sits this morning. Uh, so we're thankful for that. Now, let me just give a little exclamation a minute, if it's all right, to take this this time. I think I'm watching the clock there. At 10 o'clock, we're supposed to be out of understood. I heard it through the grapevine just a few minutes ago. And I'm uh, just like a freight train. I'm long-winded. And, and I, I remember the first time when I started to preach and I was a little Baptist preacher, I'd carry that Bible under my arm and I thought I was just a real preacher. Somebody say, are you a preacher? I said, sure. Yes, sir. I really am. And uh, it reminds me, when I was a boy out on the farm, my, uh, my father was a rider. And he uh, break horses and follow the... Uh, rodeo to break the horses and so forth. He was really a good rider. Well, I thought being his son, surely I was a rider too. So I, Daddy would be way out the back of the farm with his horses, you know, and I'd take out the old plow horse, you know, old and stoved up, stiff and tired. And we had an old water trough hewed out of a log. How many ever seen one of that? Well, what part of Kentucky are you from? <laughs> And so, and we used to go down there and get stung with the honeybees, you know, come and get their water. And they, so I look and see Daddy make his round through the cornfield way back to back. I go in and get his saddle and a handful of cuckoo birds, you know, and I slip it up under the saddle, pull up the cinch, you climb up in it, and that poor old horse. My little brother's sitting all around there hollering, ride him, Billy, ride him. You know, and the poor horse, so tired, he couldn't even get his feet off the ground. You know, on. I thought, man, am I a rider. I'd read too many western stories that was, so um, I, I thought maybe you know well you know I got one day I decided that uh, they needed me out in the west to break their horses you know and I, about 18 years old they had to have me my, my services was needed so I slipped out went out west and I tried to buy me a pair of shafts a little bitty fellow you know and I thought it had pretty it had A-R-I-Z-O-N-A and a steer's head on it now oh my that's beautiful when I put them on, I looked like one of these little uh, game chickens, you know, with them feathers on. I couldn't walk with the thing, so it just got me a pair of, of Levi's. I thought, well, I'll ride the silver saddle. I'll go out and get me some. I'll sit out there and wait till they bring them bucking horses out. There's some of them guys get through it. I'll show them how to ride them. My daddy's a rider. So I climbed up on the fence and they had me breaking some horses. And I looked over in that pen and I seen them outlaws in there that, my, that, you couldn't even throw fodder into him. It's a while he wouldn't eat it. So I thought, hey, I don't know. That don't look like that old plow horse I rode. So I looked at him for a while. After a while, they had one there they called a Kansas outlaw. So they brought him out a great big heavy horse, about 17 hands in it. He was really a horse. So they put a, had a fine man there with all of his great uniform on and everything. The girls all waving at him. He was quite a star. I looked at him as he came out of his automobile and he said, this man can ride this horse. So they put him in the chute and he got up on there and got him saddled up. He got set in his saddle and he opened the gate. My, oh my. About two twists in the sunfish and he it looked like he could throw the saddle over the moon. i never seen such a... Well, the uh, pickup's got the horse and the ambulance got the rider. <laughs> Here come the caller around. You know, he said... Uh, I'll give any man here five hundred dollars that can stay on him sixty seconds. He come right down the line. I don't know how it ever was. He picked me right out, sitting there, this sitting there with all these old disfigured cowboy mule. My legs wasn't bold or nothing, but I, I thought I was a real rider. I sat there with him. I was fellowshipping with him, you know, a hat sitting on the back of my head. It's about seventeen years old, I guess. Looking around like that, he comes said, "Are you a rider?" I said. No, sir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was a little Baptist preacher. I used to think God called me to be the defender of the Word. See, He was defending the, the faith. One day I was over in St. Louis, Missouri, and I went into a tent meeting. I ran into a Robert Darty. He's a Pentecostal preacher. I sat up on the platform with him. <laughs> Man, that man preached till he get blue in the face and buckle his knees together and catch his breath. You could hear him for two city blocks and come back up preaching. <laughs> and somebody said, you preach? I said, no, sir. <laughs> I get amongst the Pentecostal people. I don't say much about being a preacher. I'm about that like it was with the horse. You see, I just said, no, the Lord called me to pray for his sick children. <laughs> so we are, we're happy to be here this morning. And this... While we're on the thought of riding, I love outdoors. That's where I found God. And 
I used to herd quite a bit in Colorado, go up there now. I usually ride the roundups and so forth. We had the up on Troubles River. Uh, many times I stood there by the side of the gate when we was having the roundup, spring roundup, sending the cattle up the Hereford Association grazes the valley. Raise two ton of hay, you have a right on your ranch to put a cow on the forest. And some of them has hundreds of head because they got where they can irrigate down there. They have that wild meta. And then have a, every spring when they run them cattle up on the forest up there, the, the ranger stands there and counts those cattle and watches the brands for each one branded. The little group that I worked for didn't have too many, about 150, 200 head, a little uh, tripod, a brand, and grinds, a bar, diamond bar, had a, about 1,500 head. But there's one thing I always noticed when stand there, but after we got the cattle up there and the ranger stood at the drift fence, that's to keep the cattle from getting on private property again. I used to sit there and put my leg around the horn of the saddle and watch that ranger, and he'd watch them cattle coming through. Stand there, every cow went through, you had to inspect. You notice? He didn't pay much attention to the brand that was on him. But there's one thing you really watch. That was for the blood tag. See, because uh, you can't put nothing in there on account of the breed, keeping the, the line of breed right, see. Nothing but a genuine Hereford could enter that part. That part. Nothing but a Hereford had to have a blood tag to show that it is examined, and it had the blood tag to show it was a Hereford. I think that's the way the great roundup will be. He won't ask us whether we were assemblies or whether we were four square. He's going to look for that blood tag. No matter about our brand, we'll watch for the blood tag. I see the blood. I'm, I'm so glad to be associated with such people as that this morning. The Lord bless you real richly now. I sit and talk to you in my time and get away. I want to read a word of the Lord because no service is complete without the reading of the word. And now let's turn over in the scriptures here with the, just a few thoughts that I had lined out. Used to be I could think of the things I was going to say without even writing a note. But <clears throat> since I passed 25 <laughs> the second time, <laughs> I can't think of it like I used to. So I have to kind of make a note, write down my text, what I'm going to say and think of it. And then I think to a little more, I was a kid then. I just splattered like shooting a shotgun, see. But now you've got this zero. If people come to hear me because I was just a boy preacher. This is 33 years behind the pulpit for me. But now, I meet great man like I'm set before this morning. You've got to hit the target. It's got to be the word. Remember the old Baptist preacher that ordained me? I remember my first time up to preach. I just cried and beat on the desk and everything like that. And some of the elderly women come by and pat me on the back and said, Oh, honey, you're crying. You're going to be a great servant to Christ. And old Dr. Davis sat there and looked me right in the eye. And I said, How did it do, Dr. Davis? said, The worst I ever heard in my life. He deflated me. So he was an attorney. So he, he said to me, after he said, Come over to study, Billy. He said, Billy, all your emotion and all that you went through, he said, You was just trying to act like a preacher. He said, I got the same thing when I become an attorney. He said, I, my first case was a divorce case. And said, really, it didn't have no grounds at all. But said, I said to this poor woman, I cried and I uh, wrung my, my eyes. And he said, I, this poor little woman, her husband did so and so and things. And said, I got the same thing I give you. And I thought it would be a good thing. Said, the first thing you know, the, so the other attorney struck the desk and said, Judge, Your Honor, sir, how much more of this nonsense can your court stand? <laughs> said, he hasn't said one thing to defend the person yet. Not one part of the law. He's just crying and jumping up and down. He said, and you know what? That deflated me and put me back where it can. Said, now, Billy, you're doing all the emotions, crying and jumping up and down, but you never brought one thing in the Scripture that really gives the basic things. Going. That's right. Now, we're shooting a rifle. It's got to be zero. It's got to hit the spot. Lord, help us now as we read it. From Joshua, the 10th chapter. And I'm going to begin at the 12th verse and read Joshua 10 and 12. Down to the 14th or 15th verse. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel... Sun stand still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. 
Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before or after that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, if you will pardon me for a minute, I want to take a texture this morning on the subject of one word. Now you say, Brother Branham, that's not... Uh, that's not too much for an audience here of 150 people or so. That's, that's not a, enough. Oh, yes, it is. It's, it's enough. It's a word of God. See, no matter, it, it, it's, it's not the quality, it's the quantity. <coughs> like here not long ago in Louisville, Kentucky, I was thinking of a little boy that climbed up in the attic, was searching around one day, and he found a, 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 in an old... Garrett and a little trunk he found a postage stamp and he thought you know this might be worth something so he took off and found a collector and of course he had ice cream in his mind he said what will you give me for this stamp he said oh, I'll, uh, I'll give you a dollar for it oh my that's about ten cones there you know so he, he thought he made a bargain that man sold it a little later for five hundred dollars and I forget now it goes into the thousands what that stamp's worth See, as far as the paper, it wasn't worth nothing. But it's what's wrote on it. Yeah. What makes a difference? Right. This is just ordinary Indian paper. But it's what it's on it. It's God in letter form. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes it's a, no matter how little it is, that's where we people make our mistake. We're always wanting to do something big. Maybe it wasn't ordained to do something big. Maybe it's the little things that we're leaving undone is what's hurting us. Like in Canada... I was standing there with my good friend, Dr. Ern Baxter, who used to be uh, my platform man. Very fine, eloquent man. And when King George, who I had the privilege of praying for, you know, when he was healed with the multiple sclerosis, when he and his wife passed down the street that day in Vancouver, there as they went down the street there, she was in her beautiful blue dress, and the king himself sitting up there and trying to set straight hurting, sick, his ulcers bothering him, but yet he knew he was a king, so he bowed to the people, and when he went by, Ern and I listened to it, he, Ern just turned his head and started crying, he couldn't hold it, he said, Brother Branham, my king is passing by, and I thought if it'll make a Canadian feel like that, what will it do when we see our king go by? Praise God. They turned out all the children, the church, the schools did, to see the king, they give him little British flags to wave. When they returned back to school after their regular procedure, they found out that one little fellow didn't come back and the teacher got alarmed, so she went out to look for the little fella. And his standing, the little girl was standing behind the post crying her little heart out. The teacher picked her up and said, What's the matter, sweetheart? I said, Didn't you see the king? She said, Yes, I saw the king. And said, uh, Did you wave your little flag? I said, Yes, I waved a little flag. I said, What you crying about? She said, You know, she said, I'm too little. She said, I. Uh, I saw the king, and I waved my flag, but the king didn't see me. See, and her little heart was broken. That's different from our king. You can't be too little. You can't do anything. He, he sees every little move that you make. He knows all about you. Now, my subject this morning, I'm going to speak on for a few minutes, the Lord willing, is a paradox. What is a paradox? According to Webster here, it means something that's incredible but true. I think we've witnessed that last few days it's a minor stage but a paradox you know, incredible but yet it's true that makes a paradox in Hebrews 11th chapter in the third verse we see that the world was made and framed together by the word of God a few weeks ago I was in New York City at the Mars Auditorium and I heard this tape of, of Einstein talking of that galaxy of how many, if we left here and went, I think it's 150 million light years traveling at the speed of light, take us 150 million light years to get over there. And then 150 million light years to get back. Now you know how fast light travels. See, And this thing, 150 million light years. Well, if you run a, a row of nines around, around, around the world, you never break it down in years. Just nine, nine, nine close together around the world. You couldn't break it down in years. We're just saying, light travel, what is it, 800 
186,000 miles per second in a, a light year in 300 million light years. Try to figure it out. And you know how long then we've been gone from the earth? 50 years. See, they broke in to find out eternity. They say that John Glenn, the astronaut, it went around, it never taken one second off of his life, even the speed that he was traveling, about 1,700 miles. So then, see, we broke into eternity. We're an earthbound people that knows just inches and so forth. When you break into that unknown, you, you can't fathom it. Our minds are, are not uh, comprehensive. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't fathom what it means to get into that, but we know that is true. And Einstein said there's only one sensible thing to say about the world. By faith we understand that God framed the world together. And the world standing there in space, it had to come from somewhere. As science says it's a piece of the, of the sun, then where did the sun come from? So you keep breaking it down to finally you come to a place that you have to find out it had to have a beginning. See, God created the heavens and the earth. We're taught in the Bible. And how does it stand there in its space? It never moves. You, ain't, you can't take an instrument. I have war from my, finish, uh, my meetings overseas in Switzerland. One of their best watches that was given me while I was there. It's a really, a, I think in American money cost $150, $200. Maybe more. And yet, that watch will gain and lose just in a few days. I took it to a jewelry. He said, well, we have nothing that keeps perfect. But the world does. Perfectly at its time, they can tell the eclipse of the sun and the moon many, many years apart just to the minute. How it turns. And yet, nothing holds it up. Which is up and which is down? We don't know. Is the North Pole up or the South Pole up? We're in space. That's a paradox, isn't it? It cannot be explained. Anything that uh, cannot be explained like that is simply a paradox. So we find out that it was a paradox for the world to, to be in space. All right. And time and seasons. How does it cross its seasons just the same time? How that summer and winter, how it leans. It's leaning backward. If it's up straight, now we prove that one time it was up straight, as God said it was. Up the British ice fields, they can blast 500 foot through that ice. And there's palms, ferns. It showed it was once a tropic. And now, see, it leans back. From the Andalusian destruction, it leaned it back. And I believe the very thing that they throwed it out of its cycle in is ready to throw it back in its cycle now. Man destroys himself by his knowledge. See? He never, God destroys nothing. Man, and you, we can't, no matter what we, we can liquidate, we cannot annihilate. There's nothing, and even fire is the closest we have to annihilation. But you can't annihilate. When fires are burning, that gas is breaking apart. It goes right back to its original condition again. You can't annihilate nothing. Some people get so guilty till they want to, to take their body and have it burn and blow it to the seven winds of the seas. But that doesn't make any difference. You're, it isn't annihilated. You can't annihilate. God created. You can't tear down. You can, you can pervert or carry on or do other things, but you can't annihilate. God's the only one who can annihilate. He's the creator. He's the only one who has the right to do it. How it stands in space. So much we can say to that and take hours upon it. But we find out here that Joshua stopping the sun. Now that's a paradox. I remember the time my old father, he had no education. And uh, he could just hardly sign his name. But he used to say to me, he said, you know, I never could believe that, uh, that uh, but what the sun turns from the world. And I said, well, I don't know, Dad. One day in high school, I know I was talking to the high school uh, uh, a teacher there of, uh, of the Bible, and, and I asked him this question about Joshua. He said the uh, turning of the earth made the gravitation, and the gravitation helped the, the world up. And I said, then uh, why then you teach the Bible? Did uh, Joshua uh, command the, the sun to stand still? He said, God weak in his ignorance, see? And stopped the world. I said, you just got through telling me. Now, he didn't believe in the miracles of God. 
He said, uh, uh, you just got to tell me if the world ever stopped, it would stop its gravitation and then it would shoot like a comet through the air. And I said, the Bible said that the world stood still here for 24 hours. It's a paradox. But God did it anyhow. What? By man. Not a God. Not some great angel coming down from heaven. A man. <coughs> With faith in the mission that he was given to take that land. The word of God was behind it. I give you this land and everywhere the soles of your foot shall set upon, that I give you. It's yours. Footsteps meant possession. And the son is what the, the achievement he was trying to do. You see, his enemy was routed. And he knew if the son ever set them kings to get together. And they'd come back upon him with double forces. So the sun was going down and Joshua, a man commanded to do this, said, Sun, stand still. Whatever God did, I don't know, but the sun stood still. Yes. The moon over Agilon because a man, a human being, a human being was in the line of duty. In the line of duty, he commanded the sun to stand still. And if we're Christians, we have to believe this to be the infallible Word of God. Everywhere He stopped the world, stopped the sun, whatever He did, it stood still for 24 hours. I believe it. Amen. Jesus said in St. Mark eleven twenty two, If you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you've said will come to pass, you can have what you've said. But that takes motive and objective. Of course, you've got to have a reason for it. You can't have faith unless you've got some reason. As I tried to say last night, some people's faith is in their textbook. Some people's faith is in something else. But it depends on where your faith is. I want to believe God's Word. Amen. What He says is truth. Then I've got to see whether it's His will or not. Then if it's will, I've got to check out my objective to it. And then my motive in doing it. If I do it because I say, well, I'm going over the mountain here. There's a mountain before me. There's a million people on that side perishing. I've got a hundred million over here I'm preaching to. Well, if I can't get over or around or under the mountain or nothing, and yet something in my heart keeps telling me, go over the mountain, go to them, go to them, and I can't get over. Now, Jesus said they shall move this mountain. See? If it, now, the thing of it is, is first, what if I say, now first, I never, I never created that in there. Something created that. It's for a good cause because why would I go to one million when a hundred million here perishing on this side? But it's something in my heart saying, go over on that side. Now, the first thing I have to say, well, if I go over there, this side can only pay me so much a month. And over there, they, see, my motive's not right. My objective is not right. No. Well, what if I say, no, I don't care about the money. But when I get over there, someday, the ages to come, they'll put up a great big monument and say, Brother Brandon, I'm the great missionary. And still, my motive's not right. But when I don't care if they ever know who went over there, ease this in my heart. Amen. Then I'll speak to that mountain. It'll happen. <laughs> Got to see your motive and your objective. Depends on who you are and what business. What you're, what, that's where the church misses it so far. They get worked up in an emotion. And first thing you know, an enthusiasm. You don't stop and check it back here again. Check there for sure. Then it's thus saith the Lord. See, see where the right. Joshua had a commission to go over and to take that land. And God caused a great paradox. Even science can prove today the scar is still in the sky where that absolutely happened. I heard in Chicago not long ago a scientist talking that was showing it on a little chart where it had. Now we find out, again, Moses was in the line of duty too. And there was the Red Sea. Did you see that racial article that some of the people are trying to make now that Moses went through a, a bunch of reeds, a sea of reeds? Isn't that horrible? Just trying the devil, inspiring those people to take away the truth of the word. How could the waters, and then did the reeds drown up Pharaoh then when he comes? <laughs> Crazy. See, then we find out that Moses had a commission to bring those people out of Egypt to that mountain. And there it was in the line of duty. And Moses began to cry unto God when he saw the pillar of fire hanging up here and there come Pharaoh's chariots and he cried and the, the pillar of fire come down and was light to them and darkness to them. And God said, why are you crying to me? I commissioned you to do it. Speak and go forward. Oh my. The trouble is, the day the churches speak, look back and say, what did Moody say? What did Sankey say? Speak and say what God said. Let's go forward, not look back. Go this way. Praise <coughs> God. 
Yeah. It's hard on these turning corners. Church don't want to believe that, you see. They're always referring back from where their educational standpoint. Of course, that's a school in itself. See, they learn that through book learning. We know that through experience of trusting God, see, and knowing that He does do this. It was a paradox that God opened up that Dead Sea and did that great thing. Noah, in his time, remember, Noah preached in an intellectual, to an intellectual world like we're uh, preaching to now. A day when they're farther advanced in science than we are now. We can never build a pyramid. There's no way for us to do it. We haven't got the machinery to do it with. Some of them, um, if you're ever there, why, them, them boulders weigh tons, hundreds of tons. Way up in there, we have no machinery to lift it up there. Nothing at all to do it with. No power that would lift it up there. They did it. I remember school, we had a debate on that. And I took the, the side... To say that they had some secret they didn't know, and my opponent, he took the side to say that while well, they got enough man around it and they made a, a level of dirt like this, and then they rolled it up. I said, I'll, I worked in a section gang. I said, Well, we can't, you take a boxcar with wheels and then greased and put them on a railroad track, and you can't put enough man along there to push that boxcar and it empty. That's right. right. You just get one layer of man, and then the next man is, is pushing his sat man. See? You couldn't move it if you had to. They had the secret. Amen. They know how to do it. They had a greater, a greater instrument. That pyramid set so perfectly in the center of the earth, pointing that there's not a there's, uh, there's not a shadow around. No matter where the sun is, it's never got a shadow around it. See? It's a it's a perfect thing that they did, and their instruments was far beyond what we have now. And Noah preached in that great intellectual age, and Jesus said, "As it was in the days of Noah, another great intellectual age." See? Now remember. Noah had a message from God it was going to rain. Well, they never... See, the world set up straight in them days. They never had rain. But Noah said it's going to rain. The water was on the earth, not in the skies. They could take an instrument and prove there was no water there. But Noah said it's going to happen anyhow. See? And it rained. That was a paradox. See? Something that could not be explained, but God shook the earth around just in conditions so it would rain. So we see, it was a paradox for Noah to do that. Also, it was a paradox when Israel stood on one side of the hill and Goliath on the other side of the hill. They had a great challenger over there. He was a great scientist. He, he knew all the ins and outs. And when the enemy thinks he's got you to the wall, that's when he likes to bark the loudest. Amen. I remember when I first started out in this ministry, all that Pastor Davis said to me, he said, Billy, what in the world did you eat that night for supper? He couldn't understand it. I got a group of ministers together with me. They said, what's the matter with you? You think that, that? I said, I don't care. In the day of this scientific age that we're living in, and you mean to tell me that God, I said, I don't care what you say. Uh, that man, that angel of the Lord has never told me anything wrong. I said, if he sends me out there, there'll be somebody that'll listen to it. Amen. If the Baptist church don't want to, then here's my fellowship card. Amen. That's all. Amen. I knew God said so, and that settled it. Amen. Amen. said, you can't do it. That's that giant standing under sin. Yes. If you'll come over here, send one of your men and fight me, then we won't have no bloodshed. Oh, my, how easy. How they like to bark when they got it like that. said, you uh, uh, let one of your greatest men, of course, Saul was head and shoulders above his army. And he knowed better than to go out and meet that fellow on his grounds. He said, now, we won't kill anybody. We'll just let, let two of us, one of us die. Just one man die instead of the whole army sure die. He had a, a psychological point. And you notice, he said, uh, and Israel was scared to death. They wouldn't want to meet the challenge. But one day, a little old ruddy fellow come up. Piece of sheepskin wrapped around, his shoulders bent down, his hair in his face. Come up there to bring his brother some raisin cakes. That the uh, father sent him up there. His name is David. Amen. Little bitty old scrawny fella. Amen. Stand around there. But you know, there had been a few days before that, a prophet had anointed him. Amen. They wanted to put it up on his bigger brother's head because he looked better. You know, that's make impression to the, the people he's going to stand before. He looks like a king. Oh, that's what the world still got their eyes full of Hollywood. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Right. Ought to be full of Christ. Amen. Amen. That's the reason it's so hard to get the program over to the people. The message. They want to be Hollywood. Hollywood shines. Well, it's uh, shining. I live. I'm a. Uh, I'm a prospector. 
You know, fool's gold shines brighter than real gold. Anything glitters, everything glitters is not gold. After all, gold doesn't glitter, it glows. And Hollywood shines with glitter while the gospel glows with humility. Amen. Hollywood shines with its great fine churches, its psychological educated ministers who can speak and use your nouns and pronouns and everything just right while in humility. The gospel of Jesus Christ glows to the glory of God. For they know no more about it than a rabbit would know about snowshoes. They just, it's just a, excuse that expression, it's no place for this. And, um, but I, that's what I, I try to mean. You know, they don't, they don't understand it. They think it's got to be all polished up and scholarship. And, and our Pentecostal people's getting like that. Their ministers has got to go away and have so many degrees of psychology and know just how to say, ah, man, just right. <laughs> That's right. Oh, it's a disgrace, friends. It's a disgrace among us. Now, it is that I'm against the church. I'm against that system that's taking godly man and doing that. We need not to shine. We'll never get the enemy over on our ground. Uh, oh, we can't never go over on the enemy's ground and try to have fine and glitter and well-dressed and clergy collars and everything and our choir all robed and everything like them. Amen. Don't go on their ground. We can never compare with them. Let them, if they're hungry, come over to us. Amen. We're full gospel. Amen. Amen. Let's stay that way. The gospel came not in... Word only, but through power and manifestation of the Word. That's what the writer said. Power and manifestation. In other words, the Word vindicated is the Gospel. See? Mark 16. Notice now we find that in the days of Noah, that while he preached, they could hardly believe such a thing as that. They, Noah believing for such a thing. But finally, the paradox came. And uh, it happened. It actually rained. Then in the days of David, we find out that when Saul was up there with all of his uh, great army and this little ruddy looking fellow come up there and, and uh, come to bring some cakes to his brother from his father and this giant come out and made his boast <laughs> one time too many. There's a real man of God heard that boast. And he turned around and he said, you mean to tell me that you, the armies of the living God, will let that uncircumcised Philistine out there stand and tell you the days of miracles is past. Or, well, uh, <laughs> same principle. <laughs> let that uncircumcised scientist tell you, defy the armies of the living God, said, I'm ashamed of you. You're supposed to be trained man. Said, I'll go fight him. Oh, I admire his courage. He knowed what he believed. So Saul took him up there and said, Son, I admire your courage, but remember, you're nothing but a youth. See? And he is a warrior from his youth. See? And you know nothing about a sword and things. And how are you going to meet that fellow meet his challenge? He said, Saul, I was herding your servant's sheep. And a bear come in and got one of them. And he run with it. I went and took it away from him. A lion come in and got one. And I run out after him. I took a slingshot and knocked him down. When he rose up, I slew him. He said, the Lord God that gave me the victory over the lion and the bear, how much more will he give me the victory over this uncircumcised yeah. Amen. You know, I think about that when I'm praying for you. See? See, a lion called cancer come in and got one of his sheep. I ain't got no medicine. I have no shots. I don't know what radium is. I don't know nothing about theologists and these man-made things, but I know what it's in this little slingshot. Amen. I've come here after you now. I want to bring you back. Amen. It's my father's sheep. Sometimes I have to scold you and fuss at you, but it's because I love you. Always, always, always bear this in mind, that love is corrective. Amen. If your boy is sitting out here in the street and you say, Junior, dear, you shouldn't say, bless your little heart if you want. That's not a real mother or dad. Amen. You'll go get him and turn him over his arm and give him a little posterior protoplasma stimulation. <laughs> You'll fix him up just right see, if you bring him in. But you ain't going to stay there and say, Now, Junior, dear, when you know the little fellow can get hurt, you love him. Amen. And that's the reason I'm fussing. It's not trying to hurt some organization. It's wake him up. Amen. That's the truth. So we find out that David said, Saul said, Well, I tell you, if you're going to fight him, uh, uh, he put his armor on him. And 
I imagine little David, <laughs> probably about five foot tall, stooped shoulders, and this shoulder pads out about like this, and this steel. Saul found, he said, take the thing off of me. <laughs> but I'll never prove this. I don't run into about your ethics and your, all the way your pulpit manners and things you're supposed to have. <laughs> he found out that his ecclesiastical vest didn't fit a man of God. So he said, take the thing off of me. I know nothing about it. <laughs> so let me go with what I know is the truth. Amen. Where God has blessed me. That's right. Let me go with the Word, not with some educational program or something. Somebody's crooked up somewhere. I know God's Word will never fail. Amen. Other man's Word will fail, and God's His own interpreter. Amen. He said, let's go like that. Let's believe it. Amen. Doctor, no doubt, give you the best examination he can, helps you every way he can. But that's the best he knows. We know something different. When all hopes is gone, then he's the one that comes to help us. When we see this, then... David, not with a bow and arrow, not with a, because you couldn't hit the giant, no worry, he just had one place across his eyes. Just think his, his, his big spear he had would, would probably weigh 400 pounds, his fingers is 14 inches long, and just think the helmet was over top of his head, and all this breastplate, and Red David had a little bitty rock, that's all he had. He had four more in his sling, you know what them five rocks meant? F-A-I-T-H. N J E S U S. Amen. That did it, see. Amen. He had faith, it seemed. Faith, grace. Amen. He was the grace of God. And then he went to meet the giant. He only had one place that God directed that rock. And when he slew that giant to show that it could be done, then the rest of the armies grabbed their swords and away they went. They fought him to the bottom. Now, a few years ago, they said there's no such thing as divine healing. But when we stepped out to prove that there was, then the fire caught in the Pentecostal church and we've had a 15-year revival. Amen. Brother, the critics that want to give $1,000 for any proof, they, sh they shut up now. Because <laughs> it's proven. Doctor statements and everything, cancer, blind, deaf, dumb, even to them it's dead's been raised up. Because you just received faith for seeing one thing done. God is, the whole thing's based upon that. Amen. Believe every word that He said. For healing, I believe in the rapture, I believe in everything that He said is going to take place. It caused a paradox, something that was unscientifically, but it happened anyhow. It was a paradox. Now my next thought was Samson with his jawbone of the mule. Very, very strange to see this guy, Samson. A lot of people try to think that he, he was a... Uh, I've seen a, the psychological effect, uh, picture of Samson with the shoulders as big as a barn door. Well, now that would be no... No uh, straight thing to see that man pick up a lion and tear him apart. But Samson was a little bitty curly-headed shrimp, as we call it. Little bitty old guy, mommy's little boy. Long curls hanging down his back. And when you see, now remember, when the lion ran out to roar upon him, notice what happened. See? What happened? The Spirit of the Lord came on him. That's what made the difference. That's the reason they could bind him one time when the Spirit of the Lord didn't come to him. His Nazarite uh, sign wasn't there. But as long as he could feel that Nazarite sign, let him come what wanted to. And that's the way it is with you Pentecostals. When you get to that ethical spot, when you get to that spot to where you want to listen to the creed and so forth like that, I don't know about you then. But if you'll just come back to this Nazarite sign, the Amen. Holy Ghost working Amen. in you, Amen. everything's all right then. Don't be afraid of nothing. As long as the Holy Ghost is there to identify that word, let them say what they want to. Amen. Amen. God. Yes, sir. God still performs paradox. And we find out that Samson, think of that, with an old brittle jawbone of a mule that had been laying out on that prairie there for many years, and anyone knows you could hit against a rock. It'd fly to pieces. And uh, Samson, the Philistines, is up on the... And he looked around. He had nothing in his hand. And here was a thousand Philistines standing there. So he just reached out and picked up his old jawbone. And you think of those helmets was sometimes an inch and a half thick over the top of their heads. And he took that mule's jawbone and beat down a thousand Philistines. Yeah. Mm. That's right. Hallelujah. Them sticking up the rocks hide and said, You want some of it? Come on down. <laughs> it was a paradox. Amen. But the Spirit Amen. of the Lord was up on him. Amen. That's what made the difference. It was a paradox to see a man with well armed man, trained man to fight with long spears and knives and so forth, helmets and armors, and this one man standing alone out in the field with a jawbone of a mule and beat down a thousand of them. 
But it's the truth. The Bible said it was. A man that could take the gates of Gaza, that weighed down there probably eight tons apiece, big brass gates, and they fenced him in one night. Said, we'll get him, we'll comb every uh, hair in here till we find him. And we'll get him. But well, this little shrimp come out about midnight, looked out there, and the gates is in his way, so he just picked him up, put him on his shoulders, and walked up the top of the hill and sat down on him. Amen. It was a paradox. You can't Amen. fence God in. You can't tie him in nowhere. Amen. But he's God. Sure. Great victories that he won. Samson, God used him and made paradox. He used anybody as long as you'll take his word if you're ordained for the cause. If you're not, well then just stay with the ones, uh, listen to the message then. Now, we'll hurry. I see you've got about 10 minutes left. The virgin birth was a paradox. We've got to 10.30. 10.30. I'll try not to take all that. <laughs> you've been such a nice audience everywhere. And I... Uh, I, I know I'm supposed to stand here and make a speech to these businessmen and so forth, but I, I, I can't make speeches. I don't know nothing about it. Only, I remember here not long ago, Billy, just before his conversion, he was with me, and he said, Daddy, was in a place eating, and there's a song going on, you know, like that. He said, ain't that a pretty song? I said, what song? And he said, Daddy, you know, there's only one thing about you that's wrong. And I said, what's that, Billy? He said, the only thing you think about is Christ. That's all. I said, that's a compliment, son. <laughs> that's, uh, the, he thought he'd get next to me, you see, but that, that's, that did. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I, I just know him. That's all I want. to know him as life. Amen. Know these other things I don't know about. It might, might identify as a smart man, and I don't want to be a smart man. I just Amen. want to know him. I know him, as Paul said, in the power of his resurrection. Amen. That when he calls, I'll come out from among the dead. That's all. Uh, that's all. I, want him, I want my name on the right place. Amen. Now, it was a paradox when God caused a woman to conceive. It was a paradox that how God, the eternal, that fills all time and eternity, could come down and become one little baby crying in a manger. That was a paradox. It was a paradox when he died at the cross. That was a paradox. To think that God would come human so he could die as a human to redeem his own creation. He had to do that. There's nobody else. If that was anybody else besides God, if that was anybody else besides God, we're lost. For instance, what if I had the Jewish diction over you as God had over everything? And I'd say, well, I'll tell you what, uh, anybody looks at lights go to die. Like, take the tree. And uh, the first thing you know, this brother sitting here, this, uh, we'll look at that. I feel sorry for him. I, I don't want him to die. So I'll have Terry here. To, that wouldn't be right. No. What if I'd have my own son to do it? That wouldn't be right. There's only one way I can be just, and that's take his place. And God could not take a human's place being his spirit. So God created a blood cell, which was His own Son, Jesus Christ. And God came in and lived in there and lived, identified Himself in Christ. That was God, Emmanuel. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. My Father dwells in me. See? God in Christ reconciled the world. Jesus was the body, the tabernacle. God was the Spirit that lived in Him. Now, for instance, we had the Spirit by potion. He had it without measure. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God, but we have it by measure. Now, for instance, like the little gift that we have among us now. Now, that's like taking a spoonful of water out of the ocean. Jesus was the whole ocean. But this is just a spoonful. But remember, the same chemicals that's in the whole ocean is in this spoonful. Oh, well, that's more of it out there, see? He was God. We are not God. We are not God, but together. If you notice, it's so beautiful and illustrated. When that great pillar of fire that followed the children of Israel through the wilderness that appeared to St. Paul, when it come down on the day of Pentecost, it broke up and tongues of fire set up on each of them. It was God in this pillar of fire, the Logos, separating Himself among His people. Amen. Showing that Christ and the bride, see, God and His church are becoming one. Why, it's just the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Amen. Then together, brother, not in different organizations we'll ever stand. I'm a Kentuckian. Together we stand and divided we'll fall. Yes. Why did the Indians lose this country to the white people? It's because they was they was divided among themselves. How are we going to lose this great race? It's because we're divided. 
How are we going to do it? We got to stay together. We're Amen. all believers in God. Amen. The Holy Ghost takes us all in. Praise. It'll be a paradox if God ever gets us together, but He will. Just trust Amen. Him. The virgin birth. He knows how to send a persecution that'll run us together. Now, the virgin birth was. Now, Pentecost was a paradox. How that God chose a bunch of illiterate fishermen that didn't even know their, their ABCs. There's told that Peter couldn't even sign his own name. The Bible said that he and John, Acts 4, was ignorant and unlearned. But yet they take a notice that they had been with Jesus. Amen. That's the main thing. And how God shows... Now, the, the church had trained up a bunch of men for that. Thousands of fine intellectual priests who know that word they said from all the uh, meanings of it and everything. Studied it day and night, just had it in their heart and failed to see it. And God chose a bunch of men that didn't even know their, uh, how to sign their name. That was a paradox. Amen. From taking a man who was trained for the Word and by the Word and taking a man who knows nothing about the Word and confirming the Word to him. Yeah. That was a paradox. It certainly was. It was a paradox. How that them people up in that upper room there, afraid of the Jews, and walk with Jesus. But when the Holy Ghost came, they wasn't afraid no more. Out into the street they went screaming and falling and acting like a bunch of drunk people. That was a paradox. The Holy Ghost came up on them. Amen. Women and all. It wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It certainly was a paradox. The old prophet's visions was a paradox. We can't explain a vision. How are you going to explain a vision? It's something that happens to the person that he foresees things for years to come. And it happens exactly on the dot. That cannot be explained. There's no scientific way of doing it. You're some time ago in a fuss with the doctor when I was at a Qantas meeting. He said, Mr. Branham, I don't want, I, I like to hear you talk. He said, but, but I'll tell you, he said, I, I can't believe anything but what is scientifically proved. I said, do you claim to be a Christian? He said, yes, something that's puzzling to me. And I said, then you can't be. You must believe all of it. He said, I, I can't believe the virgin birth. And I said, well, I can believe, I can believe the virgin birth better than I can believe the natural birth. Certainly can. How have you ever seen the natural birth? How that's spurned from male and female? And where's, who determines what it's going to be? Here's the sperm from the male with the, the hemoglobin, the blood in it. And here's the woman, which is the egg up here. Now the first two that meets, the germ crawls into the egg and the rest of them die. And there's tens of thousands times thousands of those germs. And you say, well, the first in front. No, no. They stop. And maybe there would be a germ come up from the middle of the germs and an egg come from the very back end. And they'll come across one another. And it's determined where it's going to be boy or girl, where it's going to be redheaded or blackheaded. What disposition is going to be something unknown to science determines it. That ain't a paradox what it is. Point to point is the closest way around we, we understand. But not that time. God determines it. While the natural birth, if we had time to break it down, and even to the chemistry of the blood and so forth and prove that out, my, it's a great mystery. To hide. We, we take it commonly. And that's the trouble we Pentecostals. We're taking God too commonly. right. The whole thing, we just let it pass by. Don't do that. That's not right. Don't do that. Look at it and praise God for it. Every little thing that takes place, give God praise. That's what He shows you. Appreciate it. What if somebody keeps doing things for you and you don't even thank them or nothing? See? And after a while, they get tired of doing that. See? So now God will too. Now remember, He's able to the stones to rise children to Abraham. Now the visions of the old prophets were certainly paradox. We cannot explain them. They're without explaining. But every one of them happened just according to the way uh, that they said. Listen. Right now, in our midst, Jesus Christ is here. That's a paradox. How that He's alive after 2,000 years. Who can explain that? How that He, that Spirit, unseen can come among us and take an individual and identify himself exactly, impersonate himself in an individual, as you as a believer, and to a gift. That's a paradox. Nobody can understand that. Nobody can know how perfectly he can just say to each person what it is and what's this and where's this and what's that and never be mistaken because he's God. He can't mistake. That's a paradox. How is it now, as I come in last night and hear uh, my... Uh, Brother, my field manager here, Mr. Borders, uh, speaking. I just got the last part of it about George J. Lacey taking a picture of that angel of the Lord. Search it. 
If that isn't the same pillar of fire that followed the children of Israel. Amen. See, how do you know it's got the same nature? Amen. When Jesus was on earth, he said, I come from God. And I go to God. And we know that he was the I am. And the I am was that Logos, that pillar of fire. And then when he went back to God and ascended up on high, Saul of Tarsus was on his road down to Damascus one day. And that same light fell in his, before him and blinded him. Now look, it's possible that one can see it and the other and can't. Tens of thousands have seen it. When I used to tell about this, they say, oh, that's psychology. He just imagined that. Then people just so under emotion. But when George J. Lacey took that picture, he said to me that day over to at Houston there in the, in the building before all that Times, Life, and Colliers and all in there, the magazines. He said, Mr. Branham, I'm one of your critics too. He said, but I want to tell you, I said it was psychology. But said the mechanical eye of this camera won't take psychology. The <laughs> test fader is dead. They, he said, but someday, after you're gone, it'll be on 10 cent store. He said, I'm in position to know there's never been a supernatural being. It's been scientifically proven. But said, this is scientifically proven. Amen. The light struck the lens. Amen. Amen. And you see the testimony that I've given since a little bitty boy. And I've seen that light before me always. And you know you read the books and seen the documented statements. See, it's the truth. Amen. And I'm not here to deceive you. Amen. I got a wife. I got a little boy. Called me the other night on the phone crying. Daddy, come home. How are you crying going when he sees me leaving because so many accidents and planes and things like that? My little girls and them, my, they're daddy's girls. See, I get paid for my church. I never took an offering in my life. I don't ask people, and people give me money, I put it in foreign mission. See, some of my trustees are sitting present right now. It knows that's true. I don't spend one cent of it. I take the gospel myself and I get enough building there. I take off overseas and preach to the people that you, that you, you're, you're sponsoring them. They don't have one penny of money. And then when I go over there, then I go over and preach the gospel over there. The way's already paid by you Americans. You're building your home. You know nothing about it. But that day you'll understand. Amen. It's you doing that. I get $100 a week from my church. And that's right. I don't have no reasons to be out here. No other way. But it's, it's something in me. I can't curse it or bless it. It's, it, it's a pulsation. It, it drives me to it. Amen. You think it's easy to stand here and speak against organizations and see these brothers sitting here, brothers who stuck their neck right out to have me to come here? Even when I was a Christian businessman, brethren, when I had to tell Demas by thus saith the Lord what was going to take place in that organization, which did a few weeks ago, but Brother Ford and them told him two years ago to watch what would happen. See, you're getting it into you, go make it an organization. When it does, then I'm through with it. Amen. Amen. That minute. It's been an oasis because the people, the ministers will come in because that's your support, see. And then I get to bring the message and plant the seed everything I can. It's not because I want to be different if I'm that way, then I'm a hypocrite. That's right. Then God will never work them things to a hypocrite. That's right. God identifying a hypocrite? Amen. Far be it from God. Amen. It has Amen. to be truth. Amen. But if we could just shake ourselves a minute and realize, don't think it's some man, some man's got nothing, to, some guy has to choose somebody. Now, you historians here, did God ever use an organization? Never. Now, I want to ask you something else. When a man raised up with a message and that organization organized, an uh, organization behind that message, it died right there and God put it on the shelf and it never did come to life. Amen. I just ask, ask yourself that question. Amen. Now, see, now that's not talking. It's, now, these Catholics, all my people are Catholic. I'm an Irishman. And all my people are Irish Catholic. And they're fine people. And I'm not against the Catholic people. It's the system. Amen. I'm not against the Methodists. I'm not against the Pentecostals. It's that system that bars us out. We're that. See, you're working for one achievement here. And we're trying to produce God. Amen. The Bible. And they've already got their documents drawn up, their, their form of religion, what they believe. And outside of that, you can't cross it. And you think it's an easy thing for me to stand here and say that to brothers who love me? You think it's easy for me to bawl your sisters out with short hair? You think it's easy for me to bawl you men out for letting your women wear shorts and things like that? When them women put money in to support me missionarily over the seas. If there was no money went into the church, I could, my children couldn't live. And somebody who's nice to me and kind to me, you think it's an easy thing for me to stand there when I love people? When I was a little boy... My father being a bootlegger. 
I was hated. Anybody would go downtown and start talking to somebody nobody had nothing to do with me. They, they'd see somebody else come along they'd talk to, they'd walk away and leave me. And I, I always loved people. When I was a little boy, I sat in and reading my, my, my history book. I was reading one day and seeing there where Abraham Lincoln got off of a train down here in New Orleans and there was auctioning off a big colored slave down there and, and to breed him over to some bigger women to make better slaves. And Abraham Lincoln took his hat off and switched his fist. He was a Kentuckian too. He said, that's wrong. That's wrong. And I still say it's wrong. Amen. God made man, man made slaves. God makes us our colors, just like He does the flowers. He has a white flower, a blue flower, a red flower. Let them alone. Don't high breed it. Amen. Leave them alone. Let them the way they are. They're all God's flowers. It's His bouquet. Amen. God made man and man made slaves. We don't need to be slaves. Like I said, this Martin Luther King's leading his people to a, a crucifixion. It's communistic. Sure it is. But then people were slaves, then I'd be down here fighting for them. Right, but they're not slaves. It's an argument whether they go to school or not. I'm going to go talk about that. I just thought I'd express it, see. All right. Notice. It's just a devil. Certainly. We're all human beings. We all come from God. God by one blood made all nations. Amen. A colored man can give me a blood transfusion. His blood's just the same as mine is. Amen. Mine's just I give him one. Amen. Who am I to argue? He's my brother. Amen. But I don't believe in marrying him and marrying him like that. I don't believe in a white. What, what business would a, a beautiful, young, intelligent, colored girl want to marry a white man for and have a lad of children? Amen. What would a fine, intelligent, colored girl want to do a thing like that for? I can't understand it. And what would a white woman want to marry a colored man? When my lad of children. Why don't you stay the way God made you? Amen. Be content with such as you have. See? Now, notice the virgin birth and the prophets. All right. Now, today, he's still alive. He's still here. He's proving himself by his word. This word is God. You believe it? Amen. And then this word is lot of here for this day. There's got to be somebody come by. And that word can become quickened. And make that word live. That's when he was born to virgin birth. It was unusual. Out of the ordinary. These things are out of the ordinary. And he couldn't help it no more than Joseph could help in who he was. Look at those four patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Abraham calling. Isaac election. Or uh, vice versa. Abraham election. And Isaac calling. Jo- Jacob grace. Joseph perfection. Nothing against him. As God worked his way out. What? Luther. Wesley. Pentecost. The capstone. Amen. When the church and the word becomes the same. Amen. Same Amen. thing exactly. Perfectly. Amen. Everything in the mathematics and the Bible perfectly sets us. I wish I had a month here with you nice people. Amen. We just sit down and talk Amen. that over. And say, Amen. Okay. Amen. We're just running out. looks spooky to you. You walk away and say, I wonder. Many of them, not you. But many of them say, I wonder. You see, you just have to hit the end of it and walk away. Yeah. Just enough that you can see. The, and that's why God calls his people. It always does it that way. Notice now. Now, he's still alive today. A paradox. The pillar of fire. Identified among us scientifically. And it's still here since plumb back in the wilderness with Moses. He's still the I am. Not I was. Or I will be. I am. Present tense. Scientifically and by the Lord. This pillar that put the eyes of Paul out. Saul. And that man standing there didn't even see nothing about it. They didn't see it. But it's so bright to Paul, it put his eyes out. He always was bothered with his eyes from then on. See? He, he put it, I looked at being a Hebrew. And he said, Lord, who are you? Now, with that Hebrew, a call some kind of a spirit, Lord, that staunch man who was taught under Gamaliel, renowned teacher. And he knew the reason was, Lord, it was the Lord that led his people out of Egypt. There was that pillar of fire standing there saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Amen. Now here he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He returned and promised that to return in the last days. There he is, the Holy Spirit. Returning in the last days to bring a people. Now look, right at the end of the Jew and the Samaritan, this manifestation of the Word of God, knowing the thoughts that's in the heart. He showed that to them before they were taken away and the veil over their face that I was going to preach about tonight had, had blinded them. They didn't see it. 
Now, if he if he done that before on them two races of people, which I say these three, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, if he did that, and he lets this church here go in on intellectual conceptions, then he did wrong. But he's the same yesterday, the Ham, Sham, Japheth, same yesterday, today, and forever, and he promised to do it. So he's no respecter of person. And watch how Abraham come up through his signs and things, and the last sign that he saw done by God was God Himself. He saw Him in lights and everything else, but God Himself was manifested in a human being and eat and drink. Some man said to me one time, a minister, Brother Fox, he said, Brother Brandon, do you mean to tell me you think that one to eat was... uh, That man stood there eating that calf and eating the cornbread and the milk. You think that that was God? I said, certainly. Abraham said it was. He's going to talk to him. He ought to know it. He said he was Elohim. Amen. I said, you see, you come down to make an investigation as he is now in the investigation judgment. See who is believers. We're going to learn so much about it. Yes. Just investigate and see who really is believers. Amen. See? And he made himself manifest. He sent the little weak type down in there like in the modern messages we hear in Babylon. But watch what he done to that church. He, like, he gave it a chance too. Amen. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. And he's, what? well, my God, what did he do? You know, we're made out of 16 different uh, elements of the earth. Uh, potash and, and uh, petroleum and cosmic light and what more. He just reached over and got a handful of atoms and cosmic light and petroleum. And said, step into it, Gabriel. <laughs> and made one to step into himself. Amen. That's our God. And when he gave his message to Abraham, he vanished and turned right back to God again. All them atoms and things just broke up like a fire, breaks up the acids and, and chemicals in the wood or coal or whatever you're burning. Turn back to the unseen. I'm so glad my father's like that. Amen. See, I know after this body's become nothing, but you can't see no more. Just the chemicals where it was. Someday he'll call and I'll answer him. Amen. Yes, sir. My wife said, here not long ago, I was combing these two or three hairs I got left. <laughs> and she said, Billy, you know what? You're getting completely bald-headed. I said, I haven't lost a one of them. She said, pray tell me where they're at. I said, all right, sweetheart, I will when you do this. Tell me where they was before I got them. (laughs) (laughs) Wherever they was before I got them, they're there waiting for me to come to them. (laughs) Hallelujah. That's my God. That's our God. Sure. If we're Abraham's children, we believe it. Yes, sir. He's our God. I got to hurry. The pillar of fire is identified scientifically and by the reaction, by its character and everything else, just the same as it was when it was dwelling in the body of God's only begotten Son, so does it dwell in the body of His adopted Son for the last day. Now, I know, brethren, we've had a lot of this impersonation, but the Bible said it would happen, you know, that Jambres and Jambres would stood most It's just got to happen. But don't let that don't let that blind you. When you see a bogus dollar, remember it was made off of a real one. Amen. If it isn't, it's a, it's original. But there is original Holy Ghost, Amen. original Christ, Amen. and He is the Holy Ghost. Uh-huh. Notice now, and the pillar of fire still alive today among us after all these thousands of years, and still it's here. It's a paradox. The seed in the ground is a paradox, and I'm going to close. Got twelve minutes. The seed in the ground is a paradox. How did that little seed grow on the ground and die? And then when that little seed dies in the ground, then it, it, you might take a handful of the dirt and take it to the laboratory and examine it. You could find a germ of life if you had to. There's nothing scientific there. Show it's there. But just let the sun rock around in its right position. Watch what happens. It comes from somewhere. It, that's a paradox. They can't explain it. See, everything in it dies but the life. And the life is unseen. And wherever the little life is, is supernatural. And the natural body is completely gone. But the supernatural still lives. Now, that little seed can be buried. Now, listen to me, friends. That little seed can be buried in the ground. And if that seed hasn't become germatized with the mate, I don't care how pretty the seed is, it'll never live. I don't care how pretty our churches get. How nice we try to dress. How fine and intellectual we become unless we become in contact with the mate. And the mate is the Word. Amen. You can't rise. There's no way for you to do it. See? You know, we take corn. 
we're living in a day of hybrid. Everything's hybrid to they've even hybrid the church. That's right. They've hybrid the church from the word to intellectual creed and denomination. Jesus never said go make denominations. He never said go build schools. He said preach the gospel. Demonstrate the power of the word of promise for the day. See? But we've hybrided. Now we've got a prettier church. You Pentecostal women, your mothers used to stand on the corner with no stockings on. Little wore out shoes and antennas beating a tambourine. And the denominations laughed at her and made fun of her. Dad stood there with leading a haircut and picking up corn on the road somewhere to feed your kids. It's too bad you got away from it. Now you got a bunch of Rickies in there that wants to come like the rest of them, like Israel did, want, to, want the king of their own. You want to make your own. Okay? And now what you got? A bunch of educated Rickies. That's right. They got this intellectual, they want to be like the rest of them, doctor so and so and doctor so and so. See, and where have you got you to? You're more prettier. That's right. You're better churches. But where's that spirit was in there? Where's them all night prayer meetings and them sin of the city? Remember the Holy Spirit said in the last days, go seal those only who cry and sigh for the abominations did in the city. I want you ministers to lay your hands upon that member of your church, you Pentecostal ministers. And then when you find this, then you come and I'll apologize to you. You find that member of yours that can't rest day and night for crying for the abomination of sin that's done in the city. 90% of them stay home to see we love Susie instead. Oh, you speak with tongues, sure. Jump up and down and shout. That's all right. Nothing gets that. Nothing gets your organization either. But I'm trying to talk about life. Amen. Yeah. Where's it at? Now you show me that member. Look how worldly, how indifferent. Always the outside expresses what's on the inside. By their fruits are known. Where's it at? Now just ask, just ask your question before you condemn. See, just ask that question. Fine. See, I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help you. Amen. See, I'm trying to help you. That seed must die. When the Jew, these Greeks come to Jesus and said, we would see Jesus. Jesus, what did he say? The first thing he said, except a corner of wheat falls into the ground, dies, it abides alone. He showed them how to see him. Die to yourself. Amen. Die to your ethics, your creeds, and all this. Just be born in the Word. Yes. Into Christ. Yes. That's a paradox to see it come forth. Yes, I remember here not long ago, I was down a little place called Acta, Kentucky. Way back in the mountains, never been there before. A fellow named Mr. Woods and I, he was a Jehovah Witness, and he's at one of the meetings, and the Holy Spirit spoke. He had a boy with a crippled leg drawn up under him like that. I was standing on the platform, just preaching, and I looked, and I said, I see a man sitting way in the back of the building, three times as long as this is here, a big tent. And I said, and we was up around, um, oh, it's up on the Great Lakes, and um, and this man, I said, he's got a boy. The man comes from Kentucky, way down in Kentucky. He's a contractor. His name is Banks Woods. He's got a boy that's got polio. His legs drawn up under him. I said, thus saith the Lord, he's healed. Amen. So the woman stood there. Now, there's just many people standing right here this morning. And my people that knows David Woods. How many knows David Woods? No. That's right. Right then, he raised up in his leg perfectly normal. That settled the Jehovah Witness problem. And besides that, by them same visions has led his whole people. His brother tried to make fun of him and just tear him apart and said, What are you doing following some kind of a fanatic like that, some of these modern day cults? A reader in the Jehovah Witness. He said, Well, the man's out there cutting grass, and I had on a big old straw hat and out in the field mowing. And I come in, sat down. He said, uh, Brother Banks said, This is my brother, Lyle. I said, How do you do, Mr. Wood? He said, How do you do? Oh, real arrogant. I sat there a little bit and the Lord gave a vision. I said, Mr. Wood, I said, I suppose you don't believe this. He said, I certainly don't. And he said, there's no such a thing as things like that. He said, it's just a bunch of makeup and you got my brother all mixed up in it. I said, you know, the Bible said one word against the Holy Ghost will never be forgiven. I said, what? And Jesus was doing the same thing. See, he had never seen it yet. So he, he said, I don't believe in no such. I said, all right. If you would believe in such, you go back to your wife that you've left. You looked around at me. He looked over. Now, he didn't know what I was catching his thoughts. How strange people come around, see that on the platform, and think that you don't know just exactly how he reveals things right around you, see. But you can't say it. Jesus knows Judas is with him all the time, but you let it alone because he's a purpose of it, see. And just, so he sat there and he said, uh, looked around to Banks as if Banks told him that's his brother. 
I said, you got two children, two little blonde-headed boys. You look back to Banks and I said, what do you think if Banks told me that? I said, how about this? Night before last, you were running with a woman that's got arvin hair. And you was in a room. And in this room, there's somebody knocked on the door. And you sent her to the door because you're afraid it's a good thing you got your head blown off. Another one of her lovers is standing there with a pistol in his hand. He said, God be merciful to me. <laughs> God knows how. Now he's a sweet, staunch Christian. His father came the same way his sisters and all of them. We were down in Kentucky squirrel hunting between one of my meetings. I had two weeks. Got real dry. How many ever hunted squirrels? Oh, my brother. There's nothing like it. <laughs> so, give me a 22 rifle in the middle of August and I'm at home. And how the Lord speaks out there and no thing, and so forth. Notice, then we got real dry up on the ridges where we were at. He said, I know an old man's an infidel. So he's got 500 acres of just hills like this. And down the, the valleys, hollers we call them there, that you can walk because it's wet. Said we might get to some squirrels. Said, but he's a rough old fella. I said, well, let's uh, go down scene. So about a, a couple months before that, how we know the place is there? I had a little meeting on the Methodist campgrounds at Acton, Kentucky. And that night, while the Holy Spirit was making discernment, there's a woman sitting way back in the back of the grounds. And it called her name and said, "You've got a sister that's uh, dying with cancer of the stomach. She's just been to Louisville, and they opened her up." The cancer was wrapped so around her that she, they couldn't operate. And it's Mrs. So-and-so. She raised up and started crying. I said, when you left home tonight on a marble top dresser, you take in a little handkerchief and you put it in your purse. It's got a little uh, blue figure in the corner. You say, how? That sounds very... Well, how about Jesus telling her that uh, fish had the coin? In his mouth? How about the prophet telling the man that the mules had returned back to his <laughs> See, you just... The devil has an impersonation, yes. But you never hear one man preaching the gospel and getting souls saved. See, by, and, see you ought to know better. So then, uh, we find out, told her that, said, take that handkerchief and lay it upon your sister, for thus saith the law. She'll live. Well, I don't know why you ever know Brother Ben. I forget what his last name. Brian. That's how Ben Brian. Oh my, you'll never, you'll always know him if you ever see him once. If he'd been here, he'd been screaming so, and hands and feet in the air like that, screaming. So one time, then he went with this woman to put it on her handkerchief and, and uh, put the handkerchief up on her up there. And about two years later, when I was squirrel hunting, he said, let's go down into that. Yeah, I didn't know it was that same country. It's about 20 miles from where we were. So we went down there and draw, went back over the hills and down the hollers and up through a broom stage patch and over this way till we come to a big old house. And there sat two old men sitting under an apple tree, their old slouch hats pulled down. He said, that's him. And boy, he's a rough one. He said, he's a troubling infidel. So we stopped and I said, you better go talk to him, man. He know I'm a preacher. He wouldn't let us hunt at all. So he, he said, that walked up there and stopped. He stand there with a big chew tobacco in his mouth that run all down through his beard. Stand there. So he got around. He said, he said hello, come in. So he got up there and he said, uh, he said, my name is Woods. He said, I'm Banks Woods. He said, I'm, we've been, me and my friends been hunting over here. He said, for a few days up here around Acton. He said, uh, and said, I, um, I, uh, it's so, so dry. I said, we can't get uh, into the woods. The squirrels are so scarce. He said, I know your place is posted, but I thought maybe I'd come ask you. You'd uh, let me hunt. So what woods are you? He said, uh, I'm Jim Woods' boy. That's the Jehovah reader, witness reader, see. He said, old Jim Woods is one of the most honest men there. They lived in Indiana. Then he said, the most honest man that there ever was in this country. He said, I can certainly trust you to not kill one of my cows or start a fire. He said, just help yourself. He said, go ahead and hunt. He said, I got 500 acres here. Make yourself at home. All right. He said, thank you. He said, I guess it's all right for my pastor to come too. He said, you're a what? <laughs> he said, my pastor. Am I taking too long? He said, my pastor. And he said, Woods, you don't mean to tell me you got so low down till you have to carry a preacher with you wherever you go. <laughs> he said, uh, I thought it was about time me get out then. So I got out of the car, walked around, I said, how do you do? He looked at me and washed his tobacco around you and spit down like that. He said, and you're a preacher, huh? I said, look, squirrel blood all over me and whiskers and hat. I had a bath for two weeks, you know, and uh, laying in the woods, sleeping, you know, and, and so... I said, might not look like one, but I said, uh, I am. And he said, uh, 
Well, he said, at least I can respect you looking like a human being. He said, you look more like preachers. So I said, well, thank you, sir. He said, I'm kind of against you fellows. And I said, I, I understood from Mr. Woods you was. He said, you know, I'm an infidel I'm supposed to be. And I said, yes, but I don't think that's anything to brag about to you. And he said, well, he said, I don't know. He said, I think you fellows are barking up the wrong bush. And you know what that means? A lying dog. <laughs> see, the coot ain't up there, see. So he said, I think you all are barking up the wrong bush. There's nothing up there. And you all are just lying about it. I said, of course, that's to opinion. And uh, he said, yes, I guess that's the way you'd think it. He said, look here, mister. He said, see that old chimney up there? That's where the old house. I was born up there. My pappy built this house down here. He said, about 75 years ago. He said, I was raised right here. I walked over these hills. I've looked everywhere, up in the skies, all around. I ain't seen no God, no angels, or nothing else. I said, well, that's to opinion. And he said, I never seen one of you, but I thought was lying. He said, I don't want to hurt your feelings, mister. Uh, well, it's, well, I'm going to go to hunting or my body really train him down. So I thought, I'll just give you, Mom always said you give a cow enough rope and hang itself, see? So I thought, just go ahead. I said, yes, sir, that's right. He said, I, I met, I heard of one preacher one time that uh, if I ever meet the guy, I'm going to talk to him. He said, he might have had something. And he, we talked a little while, you know, and I said, who was that? He said, there's a fellow. He said, what was his name? He's up here at Acton. I believe he called him, I forget what his name was, Branham. <laughs> I looked over to Woods and Brother Woods said, uh, and I said <laughs> he said, you know, said, oh, oh, old lady Casmo lives up here on top of the hill. And said, we we taken her to the doctor in Louisville and said she had cancer and they just sold her back up. Said the doctor gave him medicine to give her to keep her quiet till she died. And she was then uh, just about time for her to be gone. Said she couldn't even raise in the bed. Said we had to pull a bed sheet out from under. She could put her on a bedpan. Okay? Like from under. Said wife and I go up and clean up her bed every morning. And said, there's a preacher from way out yonder, somewhere in Indiana. Said he, he come down here and he had a meeting up there. And so that man stood there that night and told her sister so and so of a handkerchief she had in her pocket. And said, come on. And said, they brought a bunch of them holy rollers over there. And said, I thought they had the Salvation Army up on top of the hill that night. That's old Ben crying out like that, you know. So he said, uh, he said, I said, well, you know, she died. So that's her family. All, you know how it is back in the country. They just have one another and they love and live for one another. It's too bad we don't do that around the big cities. So they, um, they said, we, and he was going to die. And said, well, I thought, well, that's her. Said, well, it's late. We can't get her body out till morning. Said, I'll get my wagon. And I'll go up there and get her and haul her out so we can take her to the, over to Camelsville, Kentucky, about 40 miles from there, to the undertaker. Said, the undertaker can come to the main road, which is about 8 miles, 10 miles out. Said, he can pick her body up from there. Said, no need to go over there at night. They'll just be crying. Said, we'll just wait till daylight. Said, you know, the next morning when I went up there, that woman had cooked some fried apple pies and her and her husband set the table eating. And she was living on barley water. I thought, uh-oh. I said, oh, now, now wait a minute. I said, you don't believe that. He said, and you don't believe it? <laughs> and I said, well, you was the one who said it. I thought, oh, boy, you go preach to me now. <laughs> He said, you don't believe it. I said, man, do you mean to tell me such a thing as that could happen in all these scientific age where we have the best doctor? He said, if you don't believe it, I'll take you up there and prove it to you. Now the infidel is preaching to me about God. I said, well, you, uh, you mean that? He said, yes. I said, well, what was it? He said, I want to, if I ever meet that man, I'm going to ask him what in the world it was that told him about that and how he knew that woman would be well. See? He said, I'm going to ask him about that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, that'd be a good thing. And um, I said, um, say, do you mind if I have one of them apples? And uh, it's laying on the ground fall of the year. You know, it's the well, second week in August. And the leaves are dropping off the tree and the apples are there. And it's nice apples. And I picked it up and rubbed it on these old dirty pants and went to eat it. You know, like he said, yeah, help yourself. The yellow jackets are eating them up. How many knows what a yellow jacket is? <laughs> so he said, the yellow jackets are eating them up. You can help yourself. So I said, all right. So I went to eat. I said, boy, it's a fine apple. He said, oh, yes, I planted that tree there myself 50 years ago. Hmm. That's strange. I said, um, hey, you know, we're going to have an early fall. I said, you look at there. I said, I wonder why them uh, leaves are dropping off that tree before we even have a cool night. August, the hottest. Oh, he said, the life left it. Oh, is that what does that? He said, yeah. I said, they're turning yellow and dropping off. I said, where'd the life go? He said, went down into the root. 
I said, well, uh, how, what did it do that for? See? He said, well, it's because if it, don't, if it don't go down in the root, he said, the winter will kill the tree. The germ of life is in the, in the, the sap that's in the tree. And it goes down to the root. See, what a beautiful testimony there. See, a death, burial, and resurrection again. See? Now, I said, then, it, uh, what happens then? Does it stay down there? He said, no, no. I said, comes back the next spring and brings you another bunch of apples. Yeah, and you sit here and eat them. Yeah. And then you say you've never seen God. He said, well, that's just nature. I said, is that right? That's true. I said, uh, I want to ask you something, but it's just nature. Tell me what intelligence warns that tree, that sap in the tree. It has no intelligence of its own. But what intelligence runs that sap down at the roots? They get down here and hide in the depths of the earth now till all the troubles pass. Then I'll bring you back up again. Tell me, the life that was in the leaf, just the body died. The leaf dropped off. The life itself went down, coming back with a new leaf. I said, the life hid, went out in the ground. Job, as I said, like that, oh, hide me in the grave. Say, till thy wrath be past. He's seen the tribulation coming, of course. Noah said, hide me. He said, well, that's just nature. And I said, mister, I said, if I put a bucket of water out here on the post... And then every August, that water run down to the bottom of the post. And then spring of the year, it'll come back up in a bucket again. He said, oh, oh, no, it don't have any life. I said, there you are. Now you got it. It's life. And I said, see, that's God. He said, you know, I never thought of that. I said, tell me, what, what does that? He said, I don't know. I don't know what does it. I said, it's nature. I said, well, who controls nature? Is nature an intelligence? No. He said... Well, I never had thought of it just like that. I said, I'll tell you, I'm going out here squirrel hunting. It's all right. I said, help yourself. And I said, when I come back, when I come back, you study real hard now. And when I come back, you tell me what intelligence that tells that life in that tree to go down in the root and come back next spring. And I'll tell you what the same thing that told me that woman was going to live up there that had the cancer. Amen. said, told you. I said, yes, sir. He said, are you that preacher? I said, yes, sir. I'm Brother Brandon. And there under that tree that afternoon, a simple little thing like that, I led him to Christ. Amen. Tears running down his cheeks. A year later, I went down, I pulled my truck up in the yard, it moved away, he was gone. He died. And when I come back, the lady was standing there to give me a ball and out for hunting on posted ground. He told me, honey, anytime I wanted to. She wasn't, didn't hear him say that. So I come up, I said, I, I'm sorry. I said, I come here early this morning and parked the car here where you can sit. I said, that Indiana license on there? And I said, yes, ma'am. I said, your husband, said, my husband's been dead almost a year. And she's sitting peeling apples on the back porch off that same tree. And I said, well, he told me before he died. I said, I don't believe it. I said, I was sitting right out there one day. And, and I said, and I come up and I was talking to him. They said he was an infidel. She dropped that apple and looked at me. She said, are you Brother Brown? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, forgive me. She said, forgive me. She said, he died shouting with both hands up in the air. Praising God. Knowing as that leaf come back, he'd come back again. See, a paradox. Unexplainable. Sitting eating some ice cream. Just, of course. Sitting eating some ice cream not long ago. An old druggist told me, he said, you know, Brother Baron, I got, do you believe in paradox? And I said, yes. He said, I heard your message one time on a tape. A paradox. He said, many years ago during the Depression, said the people on county on relief had to come get an order and said to get their medicine. And said, they have to stand in long lines. And said, one day, strange thing, he said, I was sitting back here reading a paper. My young boy said, he was up there and said, a little woman been standing in the line out there. She was to be mother, you know. She, anytime she had to get some medicine, the doctor prescribed it. He had to get the prescription filled. So, said so the boy, the mother just couldn't stand up no longer. He brought her up there. He said, sir, I'm going to stand in line. I've got to take my wife home. See, he said, can I take her home? The doctor said to have this medicine this afternoon, and she can't stand any longer. He said, can I, uh, can I get this prescription filled? I, see, i got the order here. i got to just get a note to say that I can do it. And said, I'll bring it right back to you. And the young boy, of course, in time of depression, you know, he said, I, I'm sorry. He said, I, I can't do that. He said, we, we got orders not to do that. He said, I can't do that. 
and said he just happened to turn around and listen to what it was. He looked up there and that poor little woman, her mouth white and holding against the side of the wall like that, and her husband standing there just as nice as he could be. He said, wait a minute, son. So I went and got a prescription, filled it, brought it back. He said, Brother Branham, when I went to hand it out, he said, I look, and I put it in the hands of the Lord Jesus. He said, I rubbed my eyes, I looked again. He said, he was the one who reached out and got that prescription. He said, you think I'm beside myself, Brother Branham? I said, no, no. In so much as you have done unto the least of these, my little ones, you have done it unto me. A paradox. Sure it was. It fulfilled the word. There's many big paradoxes we could talk about. But dear friends, as we close, let's think of this. There's one great one coming. The rapture. Let's all be ready for that one there. Let's condition our souls now before God that when that time comes that we'll go when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. The morning breaks eternal bright and fair. And when our chosen ones are gathered to their home beyond the sky, when the roll is called up yonder, let's all be there. I said this table this morning looking at you. You know, we may never eat another breakfast together. You know what? This may be the last time we'll ever eat breakfast together. But there's one thing sure by the grace of God, we're going to eat a supper together. I look across the table there and see, and I see, remember when I was down in Tampa? Yeah. That's when I made my full surrender. My, of course, tears will run down our cheeks. Then a king will come out, his beauty, wipe all tears from her eyes, and he'll cry anymore, children. It's all over. Enter into the joys of the Lord that's prepared for you since the foundation of the world. That's power. Praise the Heavenly Father, our time element means so much, Lord. We're just earthbound and just a few minutes here and there and it just runs out on us. And when we talk with you, we believe that we are risen with you now sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you're with us this morning. We are conscious of that. We know that you're here. And we're speaking on the subject of paradox. That's the supernatural. It's a paradox that you ever saved a wretch like me. How that all my people, sinners, raised in the backwoods, a couple of birds. How would you ever make a grain of wheat out of it? Lord? Paradox. Most of my people dying with their boots on, fighting guns. Oh, God. But your grace saved me. I'm ever grateful, God. I'm ever grateful. I, I pray for others, Lord. If I could, if I could just know this wonderful person, Christ. And I see Him, Lord, as a set back with the intellectual conception of it and really don't know what the person Christ is. Lord, make it real to them. Help these. These fine bunch of man, Lord. My brothers. These ministers and businessmen who in this great hour of darkness, they've identified themselves, Lord. Their convictions, even sometimes against the better thinking of their organizations, they, they want it anyhow. Bless them, Father. Bless each one. Now, while we have our heads bowed, I wonder this morning if there's any here that's not sure that a, the little leaf that you're making shade for somebody else, if the life should leave it to go back to the ground, would it rise again? Is the seed germatized with the mate that would make it come back again? If you're not absolutely sure of that, friend, let us pray about it now. You know what the life is? It's the Holy Spirit. If you haven't received that Holy Spirit in you, which is the life that was in the first plant that raised up. See, Christ first fruit of those that slept. Now, if that light that was in Him, that same Spirit, is not in you, no matter how nice you try to be, you can't come forth. There's nothing there to raise you up. You can take corn, hybrid it with something else. It won't bear no more. It's finished. If you just belong to church and you're really not filled with the Spirit of God, I know it's hard to make a stand now because they call you everything... I don't matter. They called him the same thing. And all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. They persecuted the prophets which were before him. They do it today. They persecuted those who believe the prophets that were before them. So will they do you. 
If you're not sure of it, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask you one more thing to do. Please understand me. Bow your heart, will you? Just bow your heart for a minute. And you'd say, Brother Brandon, nobody looking but God and I. I, I truly, I'm, I'm little in doubt. Or that I come up again. Will you remember me in prayer? Now, we can't make no altar call no more than you. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand and say, remember me, Brother Brandon. God bless you, 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 yes. Oh, my God. Thank you. Heavenly Father, little simple words, but yet the great Holy Spirit is near. He who knows the secret of the heart. And they've raised their hands that they're not sure about it. But yet they, they, they believe you, they, they want to. And they, they just they haven't got that. They just don't know how that road will be down the limb. Out of the branch, into the limb. Out of the limb, down into the trunk. Back up again. You're the guide, Lord. Like on a hunting trip. If you don't call ahead and make arrangements for the guide, you can get lost. And we're calling ahead now to the guide of life who said, I am the resurrection and the life. You know the way, Lord. And I'm writing you this little letter in a form of prayer and they're writing the same thing to receive them, Lord. They want to make reservations for the rapture, that great paradox. They've been in the meeting this week and they've seen your presence and they know you're here. They're not, that starts you to think that man who bring messages are not angels, they're a man. And we know that you work through man. And I pray now that their reservations will be made this morning. You said, He that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. When that day comes, then you'll guide them over the river. Out of the branch, down into the vine, into the root of the tree, if you tarry, then bring them back up again in that great paradox at the end of the road. They're yours, Lord. It's between you and them. I pray, Lord, if they've never been baptized with Christian <coughs> baptism, that they'll do that. And then they'll be filled with the Holy Ghost, the life that will guide them. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we ask this. Amen. Thank you for your kindness way over time. And I feel that I'm responsible if there's any difference to be paid in what the was the hall this morning. I'll pay it myself. I love him. the form of the rapture how it will be we meet one another before we meet him cause he knows that when we got there I'd be wondering if you were there you wondering if I were there but the Bible said we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or hinder those which are asleep for the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye and be caught up together with them. Oh, what a worship it'll be that time. Now, caught up together with them. Now, we become part of that before that time comes, catching up into the rapture. Let's just shake hands just for a moment. Now, we'll be dismissed officially just in a moment. While we sing, I love him, let's just shake hands with one another. Say, God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. I God bless you. Him. God bless you. While they are dismissing. I'll keep getting called. God bless you, brother. Hey, first love me.
bless you, brother. Now let's just raise up our hands Hallelujah. and close our eyes. Now real sweetly. Ah.